So it's my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, um, Dr. Robert Grossman. He is the director of the Center for Data Intensive Sciences and a professor in the Division of Biological Sciences at the University of Chicago. He is a core faculty and senior fellow at the Institute of Genomics and Systems Biology and the Computation Institute. He is also the founder and a partner of Open Data Group, which has been building predictive models over big data for Fortune 500 companies since 2002. His uh, topic and, and title of his presentation today is Big Data and Analytics, Five Trends and Five Challenges. Please um, join me in welcoming Dr. Grossman. Let's see, do I, um, uh, let's, how do I shift to the, um, to the PowerPoint deck? Okay. We're switching to your computer, I take it, right? Yeah. Uh, are you, VGA? We're fine. Thank you. Okay. Well, it's, it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, I'm going to talk, I'm, I'm going to give a high level talk about big data. Uh, I'm going to um, assume you know nothing about it, um, but assume you care a little bit about it. Uh, I, the term big data, like cloud computing doesn't mean anything anymore. Um, the simple way to tell when the term doesn't mean anything is if you're in an airport and waiting for your luggage and you see a term like cloud computing or big data, then from a research perspective, you see the term, say, in a large advertisement that's 10 feet by 20 feet, then that's a really a good sign that that term doesn't mean anything from a research perspective. Um, and so uh, big data is like that. Um, it, this is a 2012 report, Big Data, um, Big Impact, from uh, the World Economic Forum, where they're talking about how big data is going to impact the developing world. So it's, it's, it's a nice term to use, and we're gonna, but I'm going to try to dive down a little bit into it. So the, the, tradition, the, other, the other way to, th to sort of realize that um, you know, there's a certain trajectory to term is when the term appears on the cover of magazines like Science, Nature, The Economist, and Scientific America. And here are some covers. Uh, the, the traditional way of looking at big data is to, is to measure it in terms of bytes, like megabytes or petabytes. Um, and if you, it's, you know, um, if you go to a conference in data and people have a couple beers, um, you hear them complaining that when they reach a certain level of petabytes, their file system stop working, their interconnect stop working, and so on. So there's clearly an issue as you get more bytes uh, that certain things begin to break. The, the other way, um, because the pop, when people popularize subjects, they like alliteration, to, is to talk about data in terms of how much there is, how fast it moves, how, what the variety it is, et cetera. And so there's nothing wrong with either of these methods, but they miss a little bit about what's associated and has transitioned in big data. And I, so I want to dive a little bit further. I mean, the, the simplest way to think of, of data is that, you know, we always have data, we always will. We'll always have people who can do something with it, and we'll always have people who throw up their hands and complain. Um, and um, what does change is every few years the terms change. So I've been in the business um, since for about 30, 35 years, and so um, I, I, I see more or less the same problems. Um, I do notice there's an ebb and flow to the meetings I go to. So um, around 96 to 2001, there was a, a sort of a, a real interest in large data, and that was associated around the term data mining and knowledge discovery. And starting a few years ago, maybe five years ago, there was a sort of a resurgence of interest. Um, but more or less, there's been a continuous trajectory um, as we've changed the terms. What you see on the Google Trends is the blue is the term data mining or knowledge discovery, and the red is the term big data. 
So if you look at the sum of those two terms, nothing has changed, but we use the term slightly differently. Now, I do think certain things have changed, um, but it really is not um, whether you call it data mining statistics or knowledge discovery or um, predictive analytics. Uh, Chaitan and I were just talking, and if you want a different perspective on data, go to a conference called Strata. Um, you can't believe anything you hear at that conference, unlike other conferences where everything they say is absolutely true with no exaggeration. But it's still important to go to a conference like that because it fills sort of a large exhibit floor the size of a football field, and they're all doing things. And sort of one of the things different there is they all, many of them come from companies where they have a lot of data and they get fired if they do stupid things with it. So there's a certain Darwinian evolution that takes place. Um, it's hard to, you know, not every, the density of people who know what's going on is maybe not that great, but there are a lot of them there that know a lot. Um, and this definition um, is not a bad working definition for big data today. Data is big today if it's too big for your IT group to help you work with it. And if you need something else, then you know, the data is big. Um, so you know, depending upon whether you're Google or whether you're a, a social science lab uh, with, you know, doesn't even get a, a data closet, uh, you know, that, the size will change. But the problem remains uh, that, uh, you, you know, that you have a problem with, your with, with managing your data. Um, I, I think one of the real things that does change, and this is because of you know, the same law that drives commoditization of, of, of processors, you know, Moore's law, that gives us every 18, 24 months, you know, that may change in a few years, but right now we have a tremendous increase in our processing power. And, of, and so we can do a, a, a level of compute in every two years that is just sort of unmanageable um, uh, several years before that. That same commoditization impacts sensors. And so you have sensors um, be, um, putting out more and more data at lower and lower cost. And then, you know, com scientific communities, as we're going to discuss, organize their sensors differently. But in each case, the scientific communities organize their sensors and put out data, and that's impacting the data we see in research. Um, the, I, I think perhaps the, 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 the most fundamental transformation is every decade or so, the way we use these sensors changes and we get inc incredibly new modalities of data. So when I started um, sort of doing commercial uh, large big data in the, in the mid 90s, there was internet click data and points of transaction data and no one knew how to analyze it. And um, people um, basically created what um, now are called Beowulf clusters. They created clusters of computers. They created new statistical techniques like ensembles of models, which fit very well over clusters of computers. And over time, they were able to analyze data at that scale. Um, around 2000, a whole nother type of data came out, which is the unstructured text data on the, on the web. And then again, um, what emerged was sort of the MapReduce style of, uh, that Google introduced to analyze large unstructured data that comes up in search. And that was actually a fundamental change. And then what's going on now is there's yet another transformation in which things are moving from the internet to, the, um, to mobile and internet of things, and that's creating a third revolution. Now, one of the underlying themes here is none of these revolutions are from the scientific side. And in each of these cases, for whatever reasons, not only did the um, 10 or 100 or 1,000 fold increase in data come from the industry side, um, but the new techniques in terms of hardware and software stacks came from there too. And in each case, at least in my experience, the um, research lags and then picks up these techniques sometimes a few years later, but more, more often a decade later. And so, you know, the transition where um, a number of years ago, H high performance computing and simulation would lead, um, you see in data science that researchers by and large follow. And that's for the simple reason that if you are hired by a large internet or mobile company today, um, you will have responsibility for working with very large data sets, 
with no nonsense uh, um, uh, you know, ability to deliver out working models, um, and that will be several, that will be at least one or two orders of magnitude larger than what you would get the way we train students at most universities here. So there's a big gap, and unless your students go and intern in one of these companies, there's a big gap in how we think of data. Now, um, if you think of this from a portfolio of discovery point of view, just because data is big doesn't mean the discoveries are important. And um, it, that's just important to keep in mind. We talk a lot about big data. On the other hand, in terms of, you know, we, we run a, you know, we run a, uh, a data intensive um, computing facility with, um, you know, several hundred users, um, several petabytes of data that, that is scientific research data that's available for discovery. And I'm very interested each year in the sort of the quality of the science that comes, you know, we have a, uh, each month we give away computing hours over a petabyte of data that's about a million dollars at Amazon rates for each of our facilities, and we have several. And then you can ask is if we do a portfolio of we give this many, and so I think we have, um, a couple million core hours per facility, and the question is if we could give people for data intensive science, say 300,000 or half a million that month versus 10,000, as we do that in sort of a logarithmic distribution um, in terms of core hours over a petabyte of data, you don't always get the best science for the best from the largest allocation. And so you have to sort of think of how that works. And sort of on the, uh, a simple example is Netflix is small data. My, de my definition of small means it fits in memory. So if Netflix, so the, the Netflix prize, which was a million dollar prize, was for, um, you know, seven, year, uh, seven years of, uh, of uh, of data over half a million customers, 100 million movie ratings. It was a very tough statistical problem to solve, but it was small in the sense it fit into memory. Or it does fit in, it basically fit into a single workstation. And it was designed that so they could get 50,000 people to give them free labor. So I, I, I've, I've already alluded to this, but I want to talk just for a minute about the origins of big data because I think it's important before we go back to the scientific data. So uh, this, there's two, there's, you know, if you have data and you can't manage it, there are three things you can do in general. You can change the hardware, you could change the software, or you could change the algorithm, and then sometimes you can change the problem you ask. So if you, let's just look at how we change hardware. If we change hardware, there are two fundamental things we could do. We could do what's called scale up. We get more specialized hardware um, by adding, you know, specialized components or building specialized devices. Or we could do what's called scale out, is we add more of the devices. And you, you know, when we do HPC, when we do large data, we can take any combination in this two-dimensional space. And the interesting thing is I, I, I mentioned there was a new source of data, which is large amounts of unstructured data from the web. Um, and Google made a sort of a series of interesting dis, uh, choices. A, they decided that they would not follow the uh, sort of dominant paradigm at that time, which, which was to use fairly specialized compute with a scale up and then use a sort of a software infrastructure called message passing. Instead, they created what is now um, you know, called MapReduce and the Google file system, and we can use it in Hadoop. And they scaled out over commodity components with a new software infrastructure um, you know, that's now sort of part of Hadoop and sort of that large ecosystem you'd see at Strata. And that was driven by computational advertising. And why did computational advertising drive that? It drove it for the simple reason that if you made a small improvement in computational advertising, you generated an additional billion dollars. And um, that, you know, every time you had an additional billion dollars, you could save it to improve the hardware and software stack. And that created a virtuous loop. And, you know, we're going to hear later from the NSF, but my current understanding is in data intensive science, they spend less than a billion dollars each year. So that gave, um, that gave Google and some of these others a strong competitive advantage that build year after year and created this gap. So, uh, you know, it is now a $120 billion industry, just online advertising. 
This is the inside of Google's data center, and this is probably larger than the data centers because it costs you know, 400 to $500 million than the data centers at many universities. The core software infrastructure that came out it was released in a series of papers um, that conveniently came out when Google was way uh, working on the next generation. Um, called the, you know, and the, it was a, a software stack with a very scalable fi file system, a very scalable way to work with uh, unstructured text data over it, and then um, a sort of very scalable database. And this is sort of a picture from a couple of years ago of the $120 billion industry that sort of is around computational advertising and created these new techniques. And what this led to a new way of talking about the size of data. You talked about the size of data in terms of the number of megawatts of the data center that controlled the data. So um, Facebook would say they're building a new 30 megawatt data center for say you know, $300 million. And that would be to not only hold the data but to analyze it and to make it actionable. So that's sort of the unit, you know, say 10 to 15 megawatts is the unit uh, that they think of uh, data. And you know, one of the themes I, you know, I think is interesting from a research perspective is what is the unit that we should think of data from a research perspective so that we can make advances that you know, sort of unimaginable if we don't conceptualize the problem right. So you know, what is the analogy of this unit? <laughs> so I want to talk a little bit about analytics. That's some self-tracking data um, from someone walking around San Francisco. So, uh, you know, and, and, and the reason I'm going to start with analytics and then go to statistical models, you know, in research, what we need to do is to take data, integrate it, bring it together, build statistical models, build distributed statistical models, and make discoveries. So, you know, it, we go from data to statistical models to discoveries to validation. And we have to do that in a very scalable way. Um, the driving focus in industry is analytics. It's using, you know, in the jargon of the Fair Credit, uh, uh, you know, the Fred, Fair Credit Reporting Act (FCRA), is to do um, build statistical models that are statistically valid and empirically derived. Uh, I, I pulled from I, I pulled from these um, AP, this ASA the American Statistical Association website uh, their, their current definition on their website of statistics which I you know uh, it's a much more complicated story than this but it's really uh, focused around uncertainty uh, the you know some of the best advances in big data come from statisticians but you know there's a sort of a wide variety within the statistical community of what is big data real? I mean, in a certain sense, statisticians are right when they say there is no such thing as big data. They're either empirically derived and statistically valid models or not. On the other hand, as you get new sources of data that are 100 or 1,000 times larger than before, the types of statistical models you build tend to be different. And it's sort of that tension that's sort of one of the interesting focal points of the field right now. This is a very busy slide, um, but occasionally, well, once on an airplane, someone asked me what I did. And so I, I tried to explain what's happened in big data in the last uh, 40 years, and it's all on this slide. And my view these days is there's very few changes, but once a decade we get a change. Um, if you go to Strata, um, and walk the, 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 and read the slogans of the marketing people, you feel that every 10 minutes there's a change and it came from that venture back company that's gonna be gone in 10 minutes, uh, whose technology will forever disappear. But from a broader perspective, there really hasn't been that many changes. So the, the first change is what we call the field. That's not fundamental. The second change is what kind of conferences do you go to and how nice are they? Um, when data mining came up, the conferences became much nicer and much nicer places um, with much nicer hotels than when it was called computationally intensive statistics. Um, and recently with big data, the conferences are even nicer. So I think from that viewpoint, um, there's been a real advance in the field because the conferences are much nicer. Uh, you know, if you read the proceedings of one of these conferences, uh, every, 
you know, every year we get another 200 algorithms that are, a quote, from the abstract, innovative and are going to fundamentally change the field. Um, on the other hand, if you look back, the number of algorithms we get that are really impactful, we seem to get one a decade or so. Um, sometimes we'll get a new algorithm, we'll take an old algorithm over larger compute and change this name, say, from neural net to deep learning, but we're still getting a new algorithm every decade or so. So, you know, we had classification tree, we had neural nets, um, then we had classification regression trees, we'd support vector machines, we had a graph algorithm, page rank, and now I don't know quite what the best algorithm is. I, every time I go to one of these conferences, I try to take a vote. Some people say it's belief metric, maybe it's the sort of di globally distributed algorithm, but we, I'm sure we have an algorithm and we're going to figure out what it is and we'll look back and it'll be obvious, but you know, there, you know, we, um, you know, we have a lot of graph algorithms. Um, it's pretty fundamental is I talked about the hardware stack, the software changes. So I talked about Hadoop. Hadoop really is useful and it's being used in, um, in, in, in computing. There's some issues with it. We got R, we got Postgres. And then the scale which we compute changes. We went from a computer to a Beowulf cluster, that is what could fit in a rack, to uh, a data center. Um, and I'm going to come back to that because the, uh, one of the questions is, what's the analogy of a data center for data intensive computing for research? And then if you, around 2011, uh, Google um, sort of released algorithms that scale across multiple data centers. This is a very old problem, but I just, you know, I've talked a lot about things, but a lot of these ideas are very, very old. Uh, you know, this is a problem that Abraham Wald worked on in World War II. The, the question were, was, you know, how do you put additional armor on airplanes? I think most people have heard this, but it's, it's worth thinking back about this. Uh, if you armor, airplanes were being shot down, down in World War II, and if you armor the whole plane, you can't, it can't take off. If you armor the wrong places, it doesn't help. And if you armor the right places, you save lives. So when they collect the data, uh, you can see when a plane comes back where the bullet holes are. So the, 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 you know, the question is, how do you build a statistical model from knowing where the bullet are in an airplane that will harden the airplane and allow more airplanes to keep back? And notice the validation is quite simple. If you put a constant number of airplanes in the field and you assume that the adversary is doing constant behavior, then your algorithm works if the number of airplanes that comes back increases. And so if you think about this, and Abraham Wall did a model, where you want to put the um, bullet hole, uh, uh, the armor, is where the bullet holes aren't, because those are the planes that didn't get back. And that, he wrote a paper about that. That sort of is a nice example of what's called selection bias. And it's a nice example that, you know, you still need to think, no matter what the software or hardware is, you still really need to think about the statistical and, and algorithms. And so um, that, that, that notion is still very, very valuable, valuable today. It's just, you know, one of the themes here is the bigger the data is, the easier it is to be stupid. So I want to stop about the historical origins of big data. Um, you know, it was, you know, it was first, the first emergence in terms of data mining came with the emergence of the internet and um, um, the data that came from click streams. The second, second renaissance with big data came when um, people sort of um, analyzed scale, data at the scale of a, of a data center from what Google's work was. And, and talk about how this looks like in science. And most of the time when you talk to people about big data, they give you one example. So this is the example when a group of uh, researchers work together to come up with one theme. It costs a billion dollars. They get it funded, maybe $10 billion. And they build one instrument consisting of lots and lots of small sensors. And they produce data. And usually this takes 10 years. And at the beginning of the 10 years, the amount of data that's being produced looks scary. But by the end of the 10 years, when the instrument's actually built, it turns out to be a fairly modest amount of data if you know what you're doing. For example, the LHC, the Large Hadron Collider, produces 
um, the raw data is about 15 petabytes. It's multiplied significantly as it's analyzed, but the raw data is 15 petabytes, which is not a big number today, even though the derived data is quite a bit bigger. So um, another modality for, uh, for researchers is when you have, say, hundreds to thousands of labs producing sort of, um, again, um, instruments that produce lots of data, but it's sort of, um, uh, you know, it comes on these sort of mid-size machines that a lab might spend a million dollars on. This is a, from a couple years ago, this is the sequencing machine that sort of changed how next-gen sequencing was done. And, um, you know, this is produced in aggregate a lot of data across biology, it's created a, a, uh, it created a crisis that after only five to eight years of discussion, uh, the bio biological community created sort of a, a, a sea change in how they do things. I'm gonna talk a little bit about that um, you know, um, in my talk. This is one of the areas I work in. Uh, you know, so this happened uh, a number of years ago, we discussed it for a number of years and we're beginning to change the way we look at large amounts of genomics data. Something that's just happening now is, um, raise your hand if you have any self-tracking device. Okay, raise your hand if you know in addition to yourself, uh, this is unrelated to the talk, I'm just sort of curious. Uh, if in addition to yourself, what third-party companies um, you, uh, make use of your self-tracking uh, do, do you, anyone track carefully who else has their self-tracking data? Raise your hand. Okay. Um, that's a whole other talk, but I'm not going to talk about that. So, but this is changing things. I'm going to come back to this. Uh, one of the ways that um, uh, people think about this, and, you know, uh, I think the Moore Foundation and the Sloan Foundation really um, took a step in sort of trying to get re research universities to think fundamentally about how to do interdisciplinary uh, a science. Now, um, the term data science was introduced in industry a number of years ago, and um, it's also been used for something pretty different in, in academic research for an emerging discipline. And again, this is sort of um, the Moore and Sloan Foundation agreed sort of um, to work together in an initiative around data science. And so this is the term I'm going to use. Um, and so you could think of data science as what comes to, what happens when I take deep math and stat, when I take deep computer science, and I take deep knowledge of a field and I bring them together. And the Moore Foundation and the Sloan Foundation talk about pie, pie, pie shaped science. Pie shaped science means you have two legs. You have a leg into the discipline where you have a deep knowledge of the discipline, uh, biology, social science, digital humanities, and you have a leg into math, stat, and computer science. Um, I split them, they don't, and that you could bring those things together to create a new science. And it's, you know, this is like any number of sciences, in, uh, starting with statistics to computer science. From an academic discipline point of view, it's still up in the air whether this is a separate discipline or whether there's a data science for physics, a data science for biology, a data science for social science. You know, I think in some sense it doesn't matter, but there are interesting challenges that are new in data science horizontal or data science vertical. Um, in addition to sort of showing you nice things that happen, I, I also want to give you a few cautionary tales. Um, how many had salmon in the last week? Okay, you may not want to listen to the next. So um, I, th again, this is pretty famous. That's a picture of a salmon uh, of the type we're going to talk about. Um, and th they, there was a, um, this is a poster that, at a meeting. Um, I'll give you a little more history. Um, I, there's a lot of research now where they put people into fMRI machines, uh, show them pictures or tell them stories or um, put chemicals into them and see what parts of the brain light up. So in this experiment, um, the, the, um, the experiment was the following. Um, that's the salmon. They took a dead salmon, and they put the dead salmon into a functional MRI machine, and they applied exactly the same um, algorithms that were used um, in about 20% of the published literature on these uh, functional MRI and emotional states and the voxels that light up. And they showed the dead salmon pictures of happy humans, 
and pictures of unhappy humans. And then they, um, they, it was a controlled experiment, and then they identified the voxel in the brain that identified happy humans. Um, because you know that's presumably important in understanding the the uh, physiology and the psychology of salmon, and um, uh, for some reason the journal would not accept this for publication, but they did accept it as a poster paper. And you know you know they, these the, the you know the references on here underneath uh, uh, well, on my slides you could see who did it. But this is, this is a classic problem. This is a classic problem is you get more data, it's easy to ignore multiple independent tests. There's standard uh, techniques to normalize out significant levels when you have multiple independent tests. They were treating each of the voxels as independent and asking if it arose above the noise level, and then you, you know, without correcting for the number of voxels, which is thousands, t uh, tens of thousands. And you know, this problem happens all the time. It's a well-known problem. Um, but that doesn't mean that the papers that are published sort of um, are aware of the problem. So I, I've said this several times. I just thought I'd remind you, the bigger the data, the easier it is to do something stupid. Um, ah, there are only 8,000 voxels. Um, most, a lot of scientists are doing things in we have millions or billions of models, so you really have to think through that you don't want to make this simple voxel mistake. So um, this is the sort of, um, I, I want to leave you with one or two uh, thoughts to think about. The first thought is, you know, um, new science. You know, I, I think a lot about how to create, uh, you know, I'm the director of a center for data intensive science at the University of Chicago. There are several other centers in data, in, in, around data um, at the university. And, you know, our center and the others, you know, um, are thinking together. And, you know, what is the academic discipline around, around data science? And so my, my point of view on this is pretty simple is that a lot of times a new discipline or new uh, 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 modality of science is, originates in an instrument. So in the same way microscopes create, you know, gave us an instrument to look at small things and telescopes gave us an instrument to look at far things, you know, we could ask what is the instrument we need to look at large data. And um, it's kind of interesting to see what the resolution increase was in some of these instruments that created new science. So for example, the, uh, the telescope gave you about a 30x increase in resolution of the naked eye. The uh, microscope gave you about a 250 increase in resolution over the naked eye. Um, when I was starting my careers, people were distinguishing the theoretical and experimental sciences for what they called simulation science, where you would take a computer here, a prey computer, and do things that couldn't be done before. As best as I can tell from looking at history, the, the Cray, that first Cray 1, which was a great supercomputing and elegant in design, gave you a 10 to 100x increase in resolution, in, in, in speed over the high-end mainframes at that time. So um, if you do a back-of-the-envelope computation, um, uh, the data centers being built by industry give you at least a hundredfold increase in resolution, the ability to do statistically valid models over data than what we have in today's academic, most academic institutions. So there are sort of only three, two conclusions. One, you could say um, because of all the um, things we're exposed to in our diets these days that we're just not as smart as we were in these other ages, and that even though we have an instrument with um, you know, maybe 10x more resolution than the prior instruments, we're not going to create a new science. Or the other one is there's a new science, and we're going to eventually figure it out. Um, it may not be interesting. It may be interesting, but there'll be something there. So um, I, I think a lot about how do we build these instruments for ourselves. And you know, this is sort of my bet for what the instrument's gonna look like and where I've spent the, uh, the last 10 years or so thinking about, um, we don't have a name and so um, because um, someone here made the mistake of inviting me to give this talk, I'm gonna call it a cyberpod. Um, this is mainly to irritate everyone in the audience so you'll come up after, to, after the talk and tell me that's the stupidest name 
uh, that I've ever heard, and I, why don't you call it you know, a tomato or something like that? So um, I'm going to call it a cyberpod. It's uh, sort of something you can afford to buy. It's about the price of what we pay for HPC, you know, on sort of national scale HPC efforts that, you know, DOE and NSF fund. Um, it's sort of, you know, a, a sort of a, that's a picture of a container full of compute. So it's one or two computers that run a hardware and software stack optimized for doing scientific discovery over data. And it, in 2004, when sort of um, the industry did this, it was at least giving you 10 to 100 increase in, in, in the amount of data you could build statistical models and make discoveries over. So um, one of the problems I'm, I've sort of asked myself, um, and I'll tell you a little bit about it, but not much, is if we had the right data pod, cyber pods, um, and then um, just as there's a database is a, a, a way to do sort of, um, uh, you know, in one specialized scaled up machine. Um, I, I, you know, databases drive a lot of science. Um, you can ask, is there a data pod that is a data software stack over a, a cyber pod of data that could drive data science and new discoveries, you know, as they come up? So I think of cyber pods and the software stack data pods. And so, you know, could we, if we could take all of the nation or all of the world's cancer data and reanalyze it every night, you know, what, what would that allow us to make in terms of discovery and treatment that we can't do today? And so this is not sort of um, absurd. Um, you know, in advertising, they advertise, they analyze all of the, you know, uh, may, they may advertise a billion individuals' response that, you know, um, in, in history to do the best advertising algorithms. Um, for the next day. You know, it's done in other areas like advertising, like high performance trading. So the question is if, if those disciplines can analyze all of the data in a field and make a sort of, um, 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 uh, you know, have a, a, a paradigm to, 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 move, to make discoveries each day, why can't we do that in, in, in science? And so the, the, this is the picture I have to summarize the talk so far. You know, um, we have this paradigm of where we get really, really smart scientists, give them a small amount of data, um, and give them years to make a discovery, um, and um, they work over, they build, they work over gigabytes or terabytes of data that is about a watts of compute, and then at the other end, you know, you ha can ask this question: Is there an ability to work at the megawatt level in cyber pods? You would probably build simpler models, but you could redo them every day. You could reanalyze the data every day. And you know, again, I'm not arguing that one side is better than others. I'm arguing that why not have a portfolio of solutions in which you take whatever you can from the whole spectrum of solution space and not ignore one end of the solution space. And so this is sort of the division and there, you know, we have one um, um, person um, driving this whole process that reanalyzes the data each day to make discoveries with new data coming in, all the text data, all the, uh, uh, all the um, you know, genomic data, all the uh, associated clinical data. So I now want to talk about five trends. Um, I'm going to talk about data commons. Um, one of the terms we can think of using for that right-hand side is a data commons. Uh, almost no one talks about data commons except for a few isolated colleagues. Uh, this is the Google Trends for the term data commons. Um, if you compare that to data mining or to big data, uh, this is a noise term. That's buried in the noise. It doesn't even arise above the noise. So. The traditional, in, bio, in, the, in the genomic sciences, the paradigm has broken um, because researchers who have a petabyte of genomic data, any researcher who has a petabyte of genomic data can't afford to have their own infrastructure, can't afford to hire the, the, the data scientists, the network scientists, the um, engineers, the data engineers, et cetera, to analyze it. So um, we were forced, after only five years of discussion, to create sort of this other paradigm um, in which we have a commons. And here I'm defining a commons where we co-locate data storage and computing infrastructure, commonly used tools, um, for analyzing and sharing data to create a resource for the, for the community. And so the question is, how do we create commons at scale that can interoperate with scientists' own infrastructure that could peer with each other and that can change the way we do data science at scale? <clears throat> 
and I'm not going to talk about them. Um, I built a series, you know, our team, and you know, we created a not-for-profit called the Open Commons Consortium to do this, has created a series of these um, for the last several years. We created something called the Open Science Data Cloud, uh, which has about a petabyte of data, and that I referred to that before. That was supported by the, the Moore Foundation for three years. Uh, we created uh, something called the BioNimbus Protected Data Cloud, another petabyte infrastructure which could hold um, large cancer uh, pr uh, genomes and clinical data from large cancer projects funded by the NCI. We're building and it's in beta testing and so if you guys are bored and don't have anything to do, um, you could beta test this. this the N NCI Genomic Data Commons is um, an infrastructure that's gonna hold research data from all National Cancer Institute funded projects and any NCI funded researcher. And they, as part of their funding, are required to put their data into a commons and it's the NCI Genomic Data Commons. It's in beta now, be released in a sort of one level release in November and another release in May for general use. And then um, the NOAA is also has a co commons for all their uh, a, a data, and we're building one of them. Um, and then Amazon, Google, IBM, Microsoft are also building commons. We're really, ours is focused on the research community. This is a picture of the genomic data commons. Um, it has today two petabytes growing to five petabytes of data. We, we analyze all that data so it has a common analysis. Mo the data that comes in has by and large be, been analyzed either by single research groups or by the centers that put them together. So this is a reanalysis of all the data and we're designing a system that could real reanalyze all NCI funded data, you know, every few months we'd like to scale up the infrastructure so we could do it even faster than that. Uh, we downloaded the two petabytes of data and processed it in real time, did QC, redid the alignment and et cetera. And this is a picture from a, um, a part of a day. At the bottom are the, this, each of those uh, lines is a file. At the bottom, the length, the time is horizontal and it's the length of time it took us to process it um, from uh, files that are almost a terabyte in size that we downloaded um, to files that are megabytes and gigabytes. So I think it's a half a million files. Um, it, we brought it in at sort of eight or nine gigabits per second for weeks um, to, to analyze it. And then, you know, I, I, there's this view that, it, the, you know, I like to do things that are simple. So once you have data that no one else has done, you could do pretty simple statistical models. So this is a statistical model we built where the, uh, the gray are uh, adenocarcinoma, to a particular type of lung cancer, uh, the purple or squamous cell carcinoma, we took, uh, we took the RNA-seq data, we did principal components analysis in about 400 dimensions, and we um, just built some simple statistical models. And the green are things that seem to be misclassified under this analysis. It's about 10% in there. Uh, there's a drug, Avastin, that works for one that doesn't work for the other. It actually shortens your life at about half if it's misapplied. So this is an example of a relatively simple statistical model that could only be done when you have enough data that has a huge impact um, that's relatively simple to do as long as you have access to the data and could do statistical analysis at scale. I want to talk about the second trend. Um, this is really analytics of things, people, and places. Uh, this is, uh, 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 we have uh, urban sensors that we're putting into Chicago. There are a number of instrumenting cities. This is the idea that to understand urban science, let's instrument a city. That's a conceptual version because the actual sensors in Chicago are, are much uglier, but um, that's what they thought it would look like before they actually built it. Um, they're actually putting sensors into all sorts of things. So you could put sensors into, wa uh, into waste bins and other things in, in cities. So cities are gonna be instrumented and produce lots of data that's gonna change how we think about urban science. Um, I think most of people have this, but there's also um, people are gonna be producing lots of data that, data that will change how we think about social science and health science. And places are gonna generate data. This is. Um, you know, certain ca many cars have phones or probe de or, or devices that emit probes. Um, the the purple is where people break, and you could sort of de see that you could observe that the cars that don't break in the right place can't navigate the curve. 
So I, I, I use the term choral space, Greek chorals for place, to be the analytics associated with place. So as you have um, anal, you know, things giving off data, people giving off data, you can annotate space in interesting ways. And here we could sort of, if we see a car not going, uh, not going uh, slow enough, you could inform the car, inform the driver that if they don't slow down, they're not gonna be able to navigate that. And this is a very simple model that is, is clear to how to build once you have enough data. My second trend is, uh, my third trend is, um, we're not doing sometimes very deep computer science for big data. And I'd like just to remind um, people, um, we've talked about the software stack that sort of does new programming paradigms. Uh, I haven't talked about the networking stack. The data centers have new types of networks. But I, I do want to mention that one of the most powerful things we have in computer science is the ability to use languages. So right now, we think of computer scientists as heroes that can do whatever they want with no discipline. And um, as long as they get an answer out, we're happy. Um, but why not give them tools and force them to use the tools? For example, there are languages for graphics. Um, my colleague Leland Wilkerson wrote a sort of a very influential book called The Grammar of Graphics, so that when we build visualization and exploratory data systems, we can, um, uh, you know, we could really do that with grammar so that we can, um, you know, manipulate the language that describes the graphics instead of always manipulating the graphics. I I've spent about 15 years of my life building models for analytics so that at scale, when we have lots of models, et cetera, like that, we, we work with the models using a language. Uh, it was first the predictive model markup language, now the portable format for analytics. And this allows you to scale up to sort of cyber pods and data centers, how you build analytics at scale. And you know, we, you know, you, if you think about visualization, I pull out D3, but there are others that allow you to sort of describe what you want to do, not how you want to visualize. The fourth trend is, you know, there are going to be a lot of policy. There are policies, and they're going to create other policies that are going to encourage people to make data available. The government is now um, asked to make data available under the. Um, Exec Order 13642 from May 13, and the guidance from OMB, that led to the NOAA, uh, which was the first agency to sort of operationalize this in terms of a CRADA, that is a cooperative agreement um, that allowed our consortium and IBM, Microsoft, and Google to sort of uh, partner with NOAA to make the 20 petabytes uh, to, to go, you know, to take, have access to any of the 20 petabytes to make it available to, in our case, researchers, to the other companies, to, to, to mainly companies. Um, but that was driven by the OMB initiative. There's also initiatives for preservation and others, um, you know, thoughts about reproducibility. So there's a sea change coming, and we don't really have the infrastructure to do that. And then I'm going to talk about the last tre trend and then leave time for, for, uh, for, is, is that clock right? Yeah. Okay, good. A lot of times they put me in places where the clocks are wrong for just to <laughs> challenge me. Um, so, you know, early in my career I did math and I, you know, the nice thing about math, it doesn't apply to anyone. Um, at the last little bit of my career, I, um, I'm a little more interested in, as you do things like data science, can it apply to anyone? Um, and so, uh, you know, I'm going to talk about what I call translational data science. So the term translational um, was um, created, um, you know, a, a number of years ago around this notion that there was a big gap between how long, a, 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 you know, a lag between how long it took a basic discovery in, in biology or medicine um, to go from the lab to the uh, uh, to the patient, and so. You know, I've put um, sort of the, you know, if we think of this as informatics in general, we have bioinformatics at the molecular cellular level, imaging informatics, clinical information, uh, clinical informatics, public health informatics, but we have translational in each of those things. Um, and so, um, you know, translational informatics is, is something that people have been struggling with for 10 years. And so one of the things that's been motivating us in our center is what you might call translational data science. 
That is, if you don't just think about the discovery, but you think about how to accelerate the impact of that discovery on populations or um, uh, patients or you know, on society, you can ask, you know, uh, there's sort of this notion that we spend all our time thinking about the hardware, software, and modeling, but most of it is, um, most of the translational effort is on um, setting up the infrastructure, getting the data on one side, um, and then deploying the model and checking it and making it actionable on the other. And the actual modeling is a very small component. So if you want to optimize the translational impact, you have to have things like languages for deployment. That's why we had created portable format for analytics. You have to create um, um, standard systems like cyberpods to take care of the data so that you can impact the whole thing. And so we think of the data engineering, data science, and applications, in this case, to genomics analysis of medical records, et cetera, where we can get discoveries, diagnosis, and therapeutics out as being sort of a way to do translational data science. And you know, these are, um, you know, th this is some example of that where we're trying to take large amounts of environmental electronic medical records and try to understand um, how we can make impacts. And this is the distribution of two diseases. One is clearly related to the physical environment. That turned out, we just analyzed the data, it's about 100 million medical records. The top turns out to be a well-known disease. And we ranked ordered all about 1,000 diseases by ICD-9 codes from um, those that have most geospatial variation to those that have least. And then we, did, we were doing a simple classifier to ask it, is the geospatial variation due to environmental, socioeconomic, uh, structural like payer provider or other. And the top is something that's clearly physical um, when you look at it. The middle, it's not so obvious what that is, but that's really social economic driven. And then you can see things that are payer provider or so on because they split very much on the sort of uh, jurisdictional lines. So I want to end um, with five challenges. So I think the one that's probably most to my heart, and maybe the hardest, is this sort of uh, way that Phil Anderson, a Nobel Prize winning physicist, asked the question. He summarized his work in statistical and in, in basically solid state physics as really being um, you know, concerned with the question is at scale, you know, as you go um, um, add more and more things, are there new emergent behavior that's really different? And there's this famous science article uh, if, um, science article in 72 called Is More Different? And, and, and I think to me, this is the fundamental question. A lot of statisticians believe, and you know, maybe, and are certainly right at some level, that you know, there is no such thing as big data, there is only good and bad statistics. Um, on the other hand, at a phenomenological level, you sort of believe as you go to scale, certain phenomena that appear that just don't appear. And that certainly is the case in solid state physics. And to me, the question in data science is, one of the outstanding questions is, what discoveries can we make in data science that show emergent properties that just aren't there at smaller scale? Um, the second challenge I've alluded to of, of, uh, sometimes is one I've been working on. It's one of the reasons we created uh, the, protect, the, the commons for genomic and clinical data is um, what's, and this is part of, you know, the, this, you know, doing a million genomes was part of the Presidential Precisional uh, Medicine Initiative is, you know, if, you know, it's, it, at $1,000, it's roughly a billion dollars of sequencing, but if there's about a terabyte of data as we get more data for patients, a million uh, terabytes is a thousand petabytes is an exabyte. That's a, something that is sort of outside of what we could easily do in science today. Uh, the question is, you know, how do we, but it, it would probably fundamentally change because cancer and other diseases are um, about rare variate, combinations of rare variants. We don't have the statistical power, and we thought we did, but every time we think we do, um, we're, we're sort of, um, um, sort of surprised by the complexity of cancer, but a million, you know, you hope that with a million genomes, an exabyte of data that you would have an understanding. But understanding statistics at that level is really a big challenge. Um, the, the other one I'm going to say is how do we create tools for research communities, data pods, and uh, uh, um, 
uh, pod, pod bases that allow us to easily give open source infrastructure that's simple and easy to manage to researchers so they could do, so they have instruments for discovery at the scale that um, data science sometimes uh, asks. Um, I, I actually had 10 challenges, but I only had time for five. So it was a little, as we get to challenge four and five, sometimes they're above and below the line. I, th I think this is an interesting problem. It's we know how to deal with a billion feature vectors. We know how to do with a million dimensions. I don't think we have a very good understanding of how we can automate, semi-automate the production of a billion statistical models and make sure that we can validate them and understand. So one of the things I'm interested in is how do we scale up our ability to work with very, very large mo numbers of models. And then, again, this is, um, if you look back, think back into some things I've said about languages, infrastructure, pods, it's really, this is part and parcel of it. And the last one, um, we have something called HCI, human computer interaction. Um, I think it might be interesting to imagine um, what a human data science interaction is. Uh, you know, initially it was the data, it was the data science and statistician doing everything. Uh, there was a period of time when the statistician did nothing. Um, I actually think there's sort of a nice, interesting middle ground where the data scientist steers these very large systems. And, you know, we, it's a sort of a good time, you know, people have mechanical Turk, they have a lot of things, but, you know, how can we bring the human back into this loop to scale things up? And so, uh, I, I, I'll, I'll, every year or so, I post a blog post, so I'm due for one. So I'm going to uh, put the, uh, the nine or 10 challenges up there and some references, but um, that's all I had to say for today. Thank you.